Recording is on. Okay. Neil Talbert is going to present uh, for today. Okay, yeah, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, so my name is Neil Talbert. I am the membership chair of intercultural communication in language education special interest group, also known as ICL SIG. And today I'm going to be talking about basically what intercultural competence is and some ways that you can teach it. So this is supposed to be an interactive poster session. So I'm not planning to go nearly the full time, maybe about 20 minutes. And yeah, I'd like to do a lot of time for questions at the end. That's personally how I get a lot of benefit out of this. So yeah, please think of your questions and and then at the end, we'll have a discussion. So let's get started. What is culture? Well, I like to use this definition from a psychologist who calls it declarative, procedural, and evaluative knowledge. So declarative knowledge is basically just what you think of as knowledge. Could be you know, what's Mickey Mouse's best friend or what's the capital of Turkey? Pretty straightforward to teach, pretty straightforward to learn, although also pretty easy to forget. Then there's procedural knowledge, which is basically skills. So knowing how to walk or your intuitive knowledge of your native language's grammar you can't always really explain it, but your knowledge of that is pretty secure. And evaluative knowledge, which is basically attitudes, opinions, or we could all even call this values. So why is it important? Well, for the workplace, this is something that next emphasizes the Ministry of Education. Um, Byron mentioned that this is important for establishing and maintaining relationships. I basically think like what's the point of learning a language if you're not going to learn how to communicate effectively? You know you could have someone who studied a language only from a textbook for 20 years but this is maybe what you could call a fluent fool. Now I might be that myself learning Japanese but it's basically someone who knows the grammar, knows the vocabulary, knows how to speak well, but doesn't really understand the way of thinking of those people in whose language community they're trying to join. So it's important. Now, what, what is it according to the experts? There's a great study by Deardorff. She interviewed um, administrators of international programs and intercultural scholars. And the, the definitions are similar. It's basically knowledge, skills, and attitudes. And that's what we'll be looking at. So knowledge. Well, again, this is the most straightforward aspect. Reminds me of a long time ago when I was planning a, my first trip abroad to China, you know, go on the internet and search what are the do's and don'ts and you learn what not to do with your chopsticks or, you know, that you're supposed to bring a gift to greet somebody. You could also say this is knowledge about history or the, the pop culture. If I may share another embarrassing memory reminds me of one of the very first classes I taught over 10 years ago in English. It was, um, it was a required class in our program, a language program called US Culture. And we had a lesson on the government, the executive, the legislative, judicial branches, and the school systems, and geography, and history, and this is not something that's really emphasized among scholars, but it is done in the schools. So it's worth considering. Now, as far as knowledge, we get into 
Hofstede's cultural dimensions. Now this is interesting. You have here is a website where you can punch in the name of a country and boom, you got all the dimensions. So what's the country's ranking on individualism? What's the country's ranking on power distance? Now this is something that isn't really emphasized in the social sciences or in applied linguistics. This is what they usually call cross-cultural communication and it's more popular with business. So it is indeed popular. I went on the website and it's actually pretty expensive to get one of these courses, but it is a pretty straightforward way to teach culture. And I imagine it's pretty straightforward to teach and pretty straightforward to assess whether it actually helps our students communicate better. I don't know, but it's interesting. So anyway, moving on to the next part. Now we're going to go into more of the social science and applied linguistics side of it. This was, um, there was a study, a meta-analysis that looked at all these different models. There are so many different models of intercultural competence. And this researcher found that there were three main aspects among scholars, attitudes, perspectives, and skills. So let's start with attitudes. This is pretty popular in applied linguistics and it relates to psychological openness, like openness to experience, being curious about other cultures. And um, this is actually what I learned when I was a master's student taking uh, an intercultural communication course that we learned about this model of intercultural sensitivity. So people start with denial. They don't even know that cultural differences exist. And, then they might be more ethnocentric once they know they exist and we move on to being more relativistic and more accepting and and yes countering bias and stereotypes and being willing to take other people's perspectives so i see this as the prerequisite to the next aspect of intercultural communicative competence which is perspective taking this is a little more complicated. So, however, it's very popular among the scholars interviewed by Deerdorf in this, uh, in this big study, 100% of scholars agreed that indeed understanding others' worldviews is an important intercultural skill. So yeah, it's important, but what is it? This is harder to explain. It's basically, if we go back to George Herbert Mead, one of the early social psychologists, he called it a common world. He even said that you don't really belong to the community until you can take that community's perspective. So as a communication skill, this would be before you speak, before you act, you have a kind of sense, a kind of generalized other, a kind of conscience of how people would react. Now we all have this. You know how your mother would react to something. You know how your best friend would react to something. But we don't know how people from another culture would react unless we've adapted. So how can we get this skill? How can we learn this? Well, one thing, one way I think is a good way to learn is through fiction. Claire Cramps, uh, someone known in our field, mentioned that fiction can take us into other lives. Uh, there was a researcher who I found pretty interesting. Now, this is not an intercultural researcher, but she mentioned that reading fiction has been shown to lead to empathic growth through the simulation of social experience. So, Basically, when we read a story, all stories are basically social experiences. It could be the social experience of James Bond or Indiana Jones, but it's all about humans interacting with other humans. And we're interested in that because we're interested in how people would respond in certain situations. So 
it creates a kind of theory of mind. We're able to get into the mind of those characters, and that's why we enjoy it. You know, even if it's a bunch of talking dogs in another galaxy, we still want those talking dogs to basically think and have psychological processes that we would understand. You know, otherwise we accuse the fiction of being, you know, just serving the plot. So, so yeah, and and going beyond that, I think that when we read fiction from in another language, we're not only understanding other characters, we're understanding a conversation between the writer and the audience. So it's kind of like eavesdropping. And I think that can help us maybe understand another way of thinking. Anyway, so I recommend letting your students read books, maybe doing some activities with them. Um, you could also do visual fiction. Now this, this researcher who was looking at empathic growth mentioned that it doesn't really matter the, if it's a book or a movie, it's more about the content, that the content is about characters and interactions. She prefers literary experiences, I believe, but uh, a warning I would give though, um, there was a researcher in our field in applied linguistics who cautioned that we should present students with films that are suitable to their level of development interculturally. So I would basically say avoid something too controversial if your students are just at the level of becoming aware that other cultures exist and there are other ways of thinking. Maybe start a little easier. And there's a lot that's been done on this. Um, it can lead to improved attitudes, being more open-minded, less biased. We're willing to see things from other perspectives. Some people also look at this through a cross-cultural lens or through critical theory. So you could do that too. Now let's move to the last aspect, which is skills. So this is something that Byram mentioned, metacognitive skills, being able to analyze what's going on around you. That's a reflective skill, but for me personally, I'm more interested in the non-reflective unconscious skills. And if we go back to Edward T. Hall, he was interested in these out of awareness processes which exerted a hidden influence on life. One thing he was talking about was, for example, nonverbal communication. He mentioned in a few pages of his book that even back then there were a lot of books about how to read quote unquote body language. You know, if someone looks up into the right, it means this. And if someone touches their nose, it means that. And I'm kind of skeptical of that. I think that there's so many things going on in a live face-to-face -face interaction that it requires a more pre-reflective, intuitive sense. And the problem with this is that it can lead to conflict, okay? So this reminds me of, um, of a video. I think it was John Gumper's and contextualization clues where you had Indians in the UK who were using different intonation, maybe falling intonation when they should have been using rising intonation. And this was taken as rude. So these skills actually affect the degree to which our students are able to build relationships interculturally. Personally, I think that it manifests in our mind as a kind of a sense, you know, when you meet someone, you just kind of feel like you like them. And a lot of that might be nonverbal, the proxemics, how close someone is to you, how touchy they are, how they dress, and so on. So how do they learn this? How do we learn this skill? Okay, this is, this is the most difficult one. This is procedural learning, it's a procedural skill. So we can't just teach this like we're teaching Hofstede's, you know, cultural dimensions, okay? It's, it's harder to package. People learn this through implicit feedback me mechanisms. So that means it takes repeated exposure and it needs to be engaging. 
So naturally our students do learn this over exposure with the host culture. If our students were, or, or if we were to spend time in another culture and have a lot of communication with those people, not just staying in our rooms and only talking to people from our own countries, we do tend to learn these implicit skills over time. But the problem is our students often don't have access to that. So this is where vicarious intercultural learning can come into it. So vicarious learning, this is um, this, this Hoover guy, this is someone in business. It's not related to applied linguistics. But he mentioned that it needs to be emotionally and cognitively engaging. So one way of doing this could be through the culture contrast method, which some of you might know about. It's active in Japan, where you have two actors up on a stage. One person represents the, you know, the culture of the viewers, and one person represents the target culture. And if it's engaging enough cognitively and, and emotionally, theoretically, they could learn something from that. So that's something to think about. Another way could be through visual media. So this is the point where I'm kind of stuck, honestly. I think this has a lot of potential for our students, but I'm not really sure how it could be implemented. See, the problem here with implicit learning is that it needs to be immediate and it needs to be repeated. So one way that this has been done before is maybe students watch a movie and they pick some key lines of the film and they kind of enact that. And I think that maybe if the teacher were involved, maybe they could get the teachers pick up on the teacher's body language and, and learn the nonverbal communication that way. Another way is maybe extending a scene. So you watch a movie and you kind of guess what happens next. You, you, or you write a journal entry from the perspective of the character and you act out some things. So anyway, those were just some of my ideas on intercultural communicative competence and how it can be taught. Now we have plenty of time for questions, so if anyone wants to shout something out or type in the chat, I'd be happy to talk to you. Thank you, Neil. Uh, if there are questions, uh, please uh, feel free to unmute yourself. And or comments, suggestions, ideas, thoughts. Post a thought in the chat. There's a culture. Ah, culture con contra. What did I say? Culture. Okay, I guess I misspoke. Thank you. I have a suggestion. I don't know if you can you hear me, Neil? Yes. Yeah. Hello. Um, hi. Um, in my graduate program, we did a simulation of uh, two different. We we put our class into two different groups, and in our separate groups, we rehearsed behaving in different cultural with different cultural rules. So, for example. In one culture, they would uh, they would talk freely about money, like, "Oh, how much, how much did you pay for that?" And and the other culture, that was a taboo topic. Um, you'd have all these different rules of you know proxemics and so on, and then you'd then you'd get the groups together and have them interact and and uh, experience a bit of you know culture shock. Um, I remember that vividly if you set it up well um it can be really powerful so um recommend um 
looking, maybe searching on the internet for things like that of, of um, simulations. Bob? Right? Bob? Yeah. Yeah, that sounds like a good way. Bob, this is Brent. And I, I was wondering, is that, is that, I think the name is something like Bafa, Bafa or something like that? I don't know. I don't know. The role, role play game that I think was yeah. set up by, it might have been like the, the US military or something who originally set it up, but they give some background information mm. and then they have to do a role play. I think it's something yeah. like Bafa or something. Right. So certain rules would be like, ask about the person's family or, or don't, right? You know? <laughs> so you'd have these clashing cultures that when you get people together, you have these very um, strong you know, culture shocks. Right. It's quite interesting. Yeah, I think that could help our students be a little bit more reflective that there's such a thing as cultural difference and that they need to be aware that if they have a, an interaction with someone that's maybe not what they expect, it could be because it's a cultural difference. There's a long comment from Miss G. Okay, yeah, I see a few oh, questions sorry, here. sorry, it's me. <laughs> my, uh, my teacher name. The first one, reflecting on his own culture. Yeah, I would say that if you're going to, if you're going to take the um, explicit route and learn explicitly about other cultures, you should probably consider about your other culture, your own culture as well. So, yeah, I think that's important. And it's been mentioned before by, uh, by researchers. If I can add just a little bit to that, Neil, because uh, just a couple days ago with the uh, Japan Intercultural Institute, we had an interesting conversation uh, talking about how sometimes students won't uh, kind of notice something is actually a cultural piece of their own culture until they experience and implicitly another way of doing that thing. So it, it might also be a way to wrap back around on that. That they just kind of take it for granted as exactly. this is just common sense, yeah. Yeah, I had the same experience. The first time I visited Japan, I not only learned about Japan, I learned a lot about my own culture because I was seeing other ways to do things. And I, I can see that it was a cultural piece then, finally. I think so, yeah. Thanks very much for the presentation, too. <laughs> yeah, thank you for coming. So someone has tried the rewriting a journal from the character's perspective and found it effective. That's good. Any other questions or comments? Maybe just one question. Um, I, I was wondering, um, have you been able, Neil, have you found any textbooks that you really like um, for using in Japan, teaching intercultural communication? Nope. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the reason I ask, and I'm, I'm teaching a course in the fall, and so I've been um, scrambling, looking around. And mm. You might look into, uh, I think Joseph Schals has published a lot of yeah. books about that. You, And I remember seeing one that looked good, so maybe you could look into that. Yeah, I've seen some of his books. Thanks. But I don't have personal experience with it. Um, yeah, maybe I guess if there's more time and no other questions going on, uh, I'd be interested to know, uh, for you, what do you think is kind of the most interesting aspect of this for you at the moment that you would like to investigate more or find out more about in the future? Thank you for that question. Uh, <laughs> I am really interested in implicit learning because I think it's so challenging to teach or to even figure out how you would go about doing that. But then it's also so important for our students because, you know, I was teaching English back in the US for a couple of years and a lot of our students would come and they would live in the US, but still they didn't have a lot of friends except for people from their own countries. So that might be because they just didn't have a lot of good interactions. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Brent, for that link in the chat to the Bafa Bafa. Yeah, they were using that at uh, University of Victoria. The business school used that as part of their summer. They have a summer training program, and that's where I first heard about it. And I was just there as an observer, but uh, the students, what I, what I understand is they got some kind of training on this fictional uh, culture, and then they mixed the, the two groups and they had to negotiate a couple different things, which like flew in the face of the other culture. So it's, it seemed, yeah, it seemed interesting. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I had one thought too, when I was um, listening through this about, for example, when you were talking about uh, uh, Indian people in the UK and how intonation might uh, make some other people feel like they were being rude or things like that. I wonder if kind of at an implicit level that um, our students might sometimes be aware that these sorts of things are happening and have compensatory methods like um, so for example sometimes we think well sometimes they're just smiling because it's awkward and they know what to do but I wonder if it might also sometimes be a tool for like to try and show that I am really trying to be nice and kind and maybe some other things aren't fitting, but this will show it more. Um, mm. Yeah, compensatory strategies, right? Because they know that there's there's some kind of communication gap going on. Yeah. That they, 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 they're maybe they're afraid problem. they might be miscommunicating, so they're trying to show you, you know, I'm, I'm being friendly. Mm. Yeah. I wonder if some things like that happen. Could be, could be interesting to look at. Yeah. Uh, could I, can I say something? Uh, my, my picture is not there. I'm sorry. I haven't got, I haven't got a microphone. Uh, can, can, can I talk? Yes. Oh, thank you. Fine. Yeah. Uh, I, I get I get a lot of my knowledge or, or experience of other cultures through reading um, I, a lot of Japanese books. Currently, ever such a lot of Korean books, but I, I find one part of me always says, "Yes, I know I'm reading about Korean culture and experiences and things like that." But the guy who wrote this book is not actually a typical Korean. If there is one such, you know, this thing about a group attitude I, I, I'm a bit skeptical about really because you, you know within each group there are individuals who have all kinds of different attitudes and so the person who wrote these books is not necessarily in any sense what you could call a typical Korean if there is one such you know mm -hmm. so I, I, I find myself getting into a kind of dilemma over that I, I don't worry a lot about it I can't say that but uh, but but um, it's it's a little question which is often in my mind. So is this is this written for a Korean audience or for well, a written for a Korean audience? Yes, they're books yeah. written in Korean for a Korean audience, but mm. because I, but I read them in English because I don't understand Korean. Is it popular in Korea? All, all of these books, I, I, there are a lot of a lot of books translated mm. into English. I, I I've read many many, uh, mm. and uh, yeah. But it's, it's no great problem. It's just that I, I, I'm often sort of uh, torn between this seeing something as representative of a culture and realizing that this is a unique individual who is not actually typical of anything, culture or, or what. E each individual is an individual and probably a creative individual more, in, more, <laughs> more non-typical than most others. Yeah, um, that is something that's that we can consider. I would say that if it, if there is a lot of people, if a lot of Koreans are reading it, then it must be somewhat of a prevalent attitude in Korea. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although that's true, we we don't really know to the extent. Yeah. yeah. It's not something I'm not sleep about. It's just something that sometimes it's pops. Curious. Into my mind. Yeah. Yeah. I had a comment just on that. Um, uh, diversity of cultures within cultures. Um, we we actually did a, an intercultural communicative exercise with some of our nursing students at uh, our medical school last year, where um, 
we actually took, uh, the students had to choose a, a culture that was, um, sorry, a foreign culture that was supposedly well represented in Japan based on population demographics of foreigners in Japan. So we chose the top 10, uh, or top, I think it was top 20 actually, um, ethnicities of uh, foreigners living in Japan. And for the major cultures, like when I say the major cultures, the, the cultures that are most represented in Japan in terms of foreign cultures, we asked the students to focus on, uh, so for example, for America and for Canada, we asked students to not focus on so-called white American culture, but to focus on perhaps a minority group within those cultures. So for example, we had students in America focusing on Native American culture. Um, in the UK, we had um, uh, South Asian culture, Indian, Pakistani, um, just as a way of breaking up the sort of stereotyped monoculture that, well, students in their junior high school or high school read a textbook, the American character is white or Hispanic, um, the UK character is white guy. Um, and it was really interesting um, having the students learn something new about this idea of like multiculturalism and, and what they perhaps perceived as American culture or British culture or Canadian culture um, is actually more complex than perhaps they had been aware of based on their experiences of the culture previously. Um, and we actually asked the students as part of that to actually make contact with representatives of their culture. So um, we tried to find uh, forums, uh, blogs of people who were representatives of these minority culture groups so that they could actually get some meaningful interaction and learn directly from people who are representatives of these cultures. Um, so uh, that was an interesting way of um, kind of challenging this idea of you know, one person, rep and one person from America represents all Americans. One person from the UK represents all British people. Um, so I, I recommend, uh, I recommend doing something like that. Yeah, I've come across that idea that we shouldn't necessarily focus on the, you know, majority culture within mm. a, you know, language group. Mm. So yeah, that sounds like a good awareness raising activity. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, before we wrap up this session, I'd like to invite you all to unmute yourselves and give Neil a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank There's you, Neil. Also a response Thank you very much. Oh. Save these comments. I can't read them. Uh, I'll have the transcript, but I'm going to stop the recording here. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Neil, for that very in-depth presentation. Bye-bye. Thanks again, Neil.